Special thanks to the Town of Vail for their support of the Vail Dance Festival and Conversations on Dance live podcast recordings. This episode was recorded live at the Manor Vale Lodge. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. All right, good morning. Thanks everyone for coming out to the last uh, podcast we'll be recording here at the Vail Dance Festival. My name is Michael Sean Breeden. I'm one of the hosts of the podcast, Conversations on Dance. And we've been doing um, interviews like this almost every morning at the festival. So if you missed any, they'll be getting published into our feed um, over the next month or so. Uh, my co-host, Rebecca King Ferraro, is on maternity leave, but I've been lucky enough to be joined by several of the artists of the festival as co-hosts for this event. So uh, Mira Nadon, New York City Ballet soloist, will be helping me out with hosting duties today. Thank you, Mira. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and we will be interviewing our good friend and New York City Ballet principal, Giovanni Furlan. Thanks for coming out, Giovanni. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So uh, let's just go back to the start, like I always do, and hear a little bit about, um, you know, you were, you were raised in Brazil. Uh, how did you first become um, interested in dance, and what sort of early training did you have? Uh, so growing up, I always liked to dance, um, like at family parties and barbecues, nothing related to ballet, like there are no artists in my family. Uh, but because I had this interest for movement, uh, my grandma actually saw that, you know, you should try ballet. And there is this really uh, good ballet school in my hometown called the Bolshoi. The Bolshoi has a school in my hometown. And they go and test, um, you know, just like regular people. I was in fourth grade and they came into my school and they just asked who wants to try out so i raised my hand because my grandma told me that i should um so but i knew nothing and the test like you did not need to dance Mm -hmm. uh they basically just like were all lined up like in our underwear it's very like military style and they just like look at your body to see like if your joints are mobile if your limbs are like the right length if you have like good proportions And then they decide if they want to give you a scholarship to the school or not. So that was like my start in dance. So was your early training then like super hardcore? Super hardcore. It was very serious. Um, And I was 11 when I started. This was in 2004. And it was basically just like doing like exercises on the floor to get the body ready to start doing ballet. Like Mm -hmm. we did not touch the bar for like a whole year. It was literally just doing floor exercises and strengthening and yeah it was very very serious and i remember like not understanding why my body hurt i started like feeling sore and i was like what is this why am i feeling like this <laughs> but i liked it i like right away i fell in love with like the discipline and like being like a little like soldier almost like i wanted to be like the best student so that like kind of got me you know going right so from there how did you find out about miami city ballet and how is that training different from the bolshoi training you were going through so um, I actually didn't find out about Miami City Ballet because that was, you know, the first um, school actually that I joined in the United States until I got a scholarship for it. Like, you know, I I was 17 at the time in Brazil training. By that time, you know, I figured out, like, I want to be a dancer. People can actually work with this. Like, this is an actual job. Um, so I went to this competition in Jackson, Mississippi. It's called the Jackson IBC it happens every four years. It's this really big competition. And there I um, yeah, I was participating in the competition, but that I did not do well, like at all. There were three <laughs> rounds. I was cut on the first round. I felt like very unprepared, very nervous. Um, but there were classes every day. So I was just taking classes like throughout the three weeks. I think the competition went for like three weeks. And Edward Villela and Roma were there. Edward, the founder of the Miami City Ballet and former principal with the New York City Ballet. Yeah, uh, he was in the competition. And Roma Sosenko, which is our principal repertory director at Miami City Ballet, um, I guess they saw something in me, even though the judges did not. <laughs> They're like, this kid is like not cut for this. <laughs> um, and he offered me a scholarship, but I did not even know that I got the scholarship until I was at the airport, like waiting for my flight. And I was like talking to a friend and then he was like, oh, congratulations. And I was like, on what? He was like, oh, our teacher told us that you got a scholarship for Miami City Ballet School. And they didn't tell me they contacted my school in Brazil directly. So like that's when I found out. And that was like the first, you know, 
That was like the first door that opened for me. I was like super excited when I found out. Right. Did you ever consider staying in Brazil? Were there opportunities um, to have a professional ballet career there? There are opportunities, very few, like especially in comparison to how many like good schools there are in Brazil. Um, it's very, it's very like narrow, like the path that you can have in Brazil. There's one main like classical ballet company, which is like government run and you know it's a steady job but they don't perform very much it's just like not the priority really mm -hmm. of you know brazil as a country but i never never consider i once i decided i wanted to be a dancer i always like i kind of set my mind actually to new york because i was obsessed with abt like little did i know that i would be working <laughs> across them you know um, but like growing up in my school also people dreamed of going to russia because that's kind of like what we were fed, you know, like the Bolshoi is like the greatest theater. And I was like, I don't want to go to Russia. Like, <laughs> I wanted to go to the United States. I loved it. Like, um, so yeah, it was, it was an option, but I never considered staying in Brazil. I was like, if I'm going to be a dancer, I'm going to like go somewhere. Right. So, yeah. so then once you get to Miami, um, did you have sort of like, you know, I mean, it's a different culture, but just living wise, but ballet wise it's a very different culture yeah um did you have any sort of adjustment period adjusting to that training the balancing style and, and technique yeah because the vagana for like i was trained like purely russian so it's a like michael said it's super like it's a whole different world even though it's like the greatest base and i guess even you know back then all the the balancing dancers they had this russian training he kind of like just tweaked it uh, but for me, the transition actually felt very organic into the, like, the style, the technique. I mean, I still struggle, like, you know, because you can't, like, undo, you know, seven years of training that I had at such an early age. Like, you know, sometimes I'm, like, with my New York City Valley peers and just, like, I can't keep up, you know, like, in class and, like, with the fastness. Or, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, with, like, the tondus and, like, it's just a little bit different but at miami city ballet school like i had a great teacher like carter alexander he was amazing and um i think the main thing was like the musicality because you know it's just like how you get to steps like because he knew that i hadn't like i knew how to do it so he just had to like kind of wake like another side of my dancing um but it felt very organic and i fell in love with it like watching the company watching people rehearse because at miami city valley like all the studios have windows like even when you're like in the in the hallway you can see into every studio so i was just like like in love with all the dancers and how they moved and the freedom and um how people use the technique but like the it wasn't just about the technique like i could see the dancers and like everyone moving so it felt very organic like i wanted it i felt like i just like want to dance like mm -hmm. this what were some of the first ballets then that you saw that kind of um i guess converted you or made you want it to dance in that style super random but at the time the company was doing a diana and acteon and scotch symphony i think and um La Sonambula. So it was like a great, like, first, I think, um, exposure to Balanchine. And because, like, no one does, like, Balanchine's Diana and Acton. Right? Well, it, it was, I've never even heard of it. Yeah, it was made for TV. So it was made for Patty McBride and Edward Villela. Okay. They did it on the Ed Sullivan show, but it had never been oh. performed. And then Edward was like, why don't we do this? Yeah. You know, it's, um, we used to do a lot of those, like, little hidden gems or things that you know nobody else would do which i thought was really a cool part of our company yeah it is very cool and um yeah but i fell in love i think like all those ballets and just seeing people rehearse and like how everyone moved and also i loved like seeing especially the core of the ballet because sometimes when you think about you know like classical ballets and people they're like in the core in the back like sometimes they're just standing and doing simple movements but when you see like a balancing ballet like everyone is dancing as much as the principal and i thought that that was like incredible you know to have that opportunity to be dancing everyone on stage is dancing just as much so that same year you almost had your first opportunity performing with the company your first part you were ever going to do was going to be a soloist part 
I remember rehearsing yes. with you. Yeah. In um in Cranko's Romeo and Juliet, there's a, a clown king, mm-hmm. and yeah. he enters <laughs> on the shoulders of the clown. Minions. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a rehearsal with that, and I, and I mean, yeah. I just my first impression was like, oh wow, this boy is flexible. He, he enters <laughs> on the shoulders in a split. Yeah. Like, and oh, wow. so it was, you know, it was going to be a big Very deal dramatic. for you. Yeah. It was. Yeah. Obviously, like I mean, very few students perform at the company. Period. But no students perform with the company in soloist roles. Yes. But you were, you experienced some sort of injury. In that yeah. I movie. was actually preparing for uh, the workshop, like the student showcase. Cause yeah, I was in that transition, like kind of working with the company, but still with the school. So we were preparing balance in Swan Lake. Cause that was the first balance ballet I actually ever danced. And I sprained my ankle, like landing from a jump. And then I kind of like missed that opportunity, but I was able to come back and do the workshop. I just missed the clown king, but I did do it um, later on. <laughs> later on, like you did? I did the yeah. same year I did Romeo. Like okay. I would go, it was like first cast Romeo, uh, clown king, third cast so you, Romeo. So I would be going back and forth. Back on my shoulders. <laughs> it's, I just blocked that out, I guess. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What kind of ballet? Sometimes you just block out unless you are Romeo and Juliet. Yeah, it's yourself. true. Yeah. Those ballets are just like, <laughs> 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 so, um, Having an, an injury early on in your career, um, you know, it's something that every dancer has to deal with eventually. Yeah. Almost everyone, ninety nine percent of people. Um, do you think that that helped prepare you for later later on, like enduring that? Like, um, did you did you find a way, a path? Like, this is how I come back, and like, this is how I build my mental strength as well to get through this moment. Honestly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was too young. I was like 18. I did not think that deep about my... (laughs) um, I just didn't understand, to be honest, like how my body wasn't dancing the way I wanted it to move. Like, I was just like, why is this foot not working? It took months. I think I just kind of like came back still in pain and I was so eager because that year it was 2011 Mm -hmm. and Miami City Ballet was touring to Paris for Elisette de la Danse and it was like this three week thing and I had just become an apprentice and it was like a huge deal that like I remember Roma coming up to me she's like if you don't get better Paris is not gonna happen for you (laughs) (laughs) I was like great that's gonna heal me right away (laughs) which it did (laughs) Uh, yeah the pressure you know (laughs) So, yeah. So I, I guess it just made me like come back, even though I don't know if I was ready. Yeah, I'm just realizing how short this timeline is now. In my, yeah, you know, in my head it was longer. So you went from you know you're doing your first ballet, Balanchine Swan Lake, mm-hmm. which is not what one might consider like you know. It's very classical you, if you think about it for the especially for the man, right? And then we we go to Paris in the summer of 2011, and there's a lot of really you know signature Balanchine works for temperaments and square dance and ballet imperial and you ended up having to get thrown into yeah square dance yeah as an apprentice and you had pc2 and ballet pc2 imperial. um like and, the theme, and theme and variations. and theme you, you got thrown in or you were well M- mark like right before we had this like more senior core member and that like i guess a week before he was like oh i don't want to do this anymore it's too hard and then <laughs> i i got thrown in before but then in paris yeah i got thrown in into i think maybe the two hardest like core roles yeah. that there are for yeah like so, the 18 year old who i don't know i didn't even know i felt like i just fell from the sky <laughs> into the stage and i was well, like I oh mean, my god yeah i don't know how you because you only probably had what one rehearsal for each of those things yeah i mean i feel like i learned it well and i always like i think that that also was something even from my school years i always like made sure i knew what i was doing even if i was in the back and so whenever there was an opportunity i was ready i was always ready I, yeah. I remember I feared for your life. The, yeah, oh my God. Square dance. It's, I mean, <laughs> thinking about now the timeline because the competition that got me the scholarship for Miami City Ballet was in June of 2010. And in July of 2011, I was on stage with Miami City Ballet, like doing all these crazy things. Right. Um, and I remember specifically watching that show of like Square Dance. Then Neil pulled his calf. Mm-hmm. I was in the audience watching this ballet. And I was like, oh, my God, that could never be me. I don't fit in here. And then I go backstage right after the show. They're like, you're on tomorrow. And, like, it was, yeah, it was insane. But it was, I don't know, I was so happy. I remember (laughs) watching Jeanette Delgado, this, like, amazing former principal of Miami City Ballet. And, like, you know, her solo, and she does that, like, she sometimes did that, like, beautiful triple pirouette, but, Mm -hmm. you know, with so much, like, texture. And I literally opened my mouth on stage. I was like, 
<laughs> <laughs> Japani, you're on stage, like <laughs> get it together, you know. Uh, yeah. But it was it was it was wild, definitely. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of a baptism by fire. Yeah. But what were what were the next steps? What were some of the first opportunities you got later on in that season as a, a sol- in soloist or principal work? Uh, I think that year I learned like Cavalier and the Nutcracker, like, and I was an apprentice. Mm-hmm. And I'm trying to remember what we did that first. Oh, Square Dance was in the program, so mm-hmm. I got to do that and like thrown in with people that had been in the company. Like, how for how long were you there at that time? Like, maybe like ten? No, not ten years. Uh, no, maybe, like, five, five or six. Years, but yeah. you know, when you're young, you're yeah. Like, when I'm oh, young, that guy, I'm he looks like, like oh he's God, been around he's for like, ten years. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I think like Square Dance and then we were doing like a Paul Taylor ballet, mm-hmm. Piazzolla. That yeah. was like my first. And I did like a, this kind of like feature, like Pas de Deux, um, which was also very cool about being in Miami City Ballet because we dance a lot of like Paul Taylor works. Like outside of Paul Taylor Dance Company, we do like the most. So that was very cool. And then I learned Cavalier. <coughs> I think maybe it did like Spanish lead in Nutcracker, but I'm, mm-hmm. not, I'm not sure. Um yeah, and then doing like new works. We were doing Viscera by Liam Scarlett. And I was learning a principal role in Ramansky Symphonic Dances like right away. So it felt very, I always felt like, I mean, I'm going to say lucky, but I was always like in the right place at the right time. You know, like opportunities came and I always like felt eager and like ready mm-hmm. to, to do it. So uh, at this point, Edward Valella, it's his last year, and there's yeah. a big transition coming. This is something, Mary, you can speak to as well. It's like yeah. you're having your own sort of meteoric rise, but then the artistic direction is shifting gears. Yeah. How did you, what was your approach? Is there, I mean, is there anything you can do differently? Or like, how do you, how do you go into that knowing like, well, with this person, I had a very clear, easy path, and now, now it's less certain. Yeah, I honestly didn't realize like really what that meant. I was kind of just there. I was too like not. It, I think not even an age thing, but just like oblivious. Everything was too new for me to be like taking it in. So it was. I mean, it was very impactful and meaningful being with Edward. Mm-hmm. And I remember even for the the showcase when I sprained my ankle and he came to watch the rehearsal like two weeks later, and he knew what had happened to me. And like right before I run on stage and like prepare for my variation, he stopped. And he was like, oh, you don't have, you just know, you don't have to prove me anything, you know? So, like, I always, like, carry that with me. And even though I had a short time with him, you know, he was very, we we just, like, he was such a great artist and, like, how he nurtured the dancers. Uh, but at the time, I didn't realize that what it meant. I wasn't like, oh, my God, I have this great things with Edward. Is it going to be the same with, like, the new director? Um, it didn't, like, cross my, I was just, like, kind of like, okay, I'm here. <laughs> like, <laughs> Everyone is upset about this, so maybe I should be too. I don't know. I didn't understand. Yeah. Yeah. But then you still had lots of time. That year, the rep was set. Yeah. Um, and the casting was mostly set. Yeah. Lotus came in sort of last minute. It was yeah. meant to be Edward's final year. He bowed yeah. out a little early. Yes. So it kind of gave us this grace that was nice. Like, we had a full year to prove ourselves to the mm-hmm. new director rather than like right away that person has to make decisions. So yeah, you had knowing, a, yes. a lot of opportunities that year. Yeah, like the biggest one I think was uh, Robin's Dances at a Gathering right. that I was doing Green Boy, mm-hmm. which is like such an amazing role. So right away, I think that was like my first rehearsal with Lourdes Lopez, which, you know, she came and took over. Mm-hmm. So I guess there I could like show in. Right away, I feel like I stayed on the same path uh, with her that I was with Edward, you know, kind of just kept going how I was going, you know. Mm-hmm. And then you had uh, an injury that was pretty serious that required surgery. Yes. So this is a little different from an ankle sprain. Very different, um, yes. So what was that experience like for you, dealing with, you know, acceptance and then the yeah. process of coming back? That was rough. Um, it still is kind of, I feel like I still carry stuff from that. Um so it was the first program when Lourdes took over. We were doing, um, oh my God, I forgot the name of the choreographer for Le Patineau. Um Frederick Ashton. Ashton. Ashton <laughs> Le Patineau. Um, th- th- maybe one of the hardest ballets I've ever done. It's the hardest we ballet ever. so hard. And we have fun we, stories about that. I had to do every show. <laughs> Remember when awful. the lights went off? <laughs> the theater lost power. We were on stage crossing each other doing jetes. Anyway, <laughs> side, <laughs> got sidetracked. <laughs> uh, but it was amazing. Um, so I landed from a jump doing that and I felt my foot like immediately go, but just how I was like mentally, you know, um, prepared to just keep working through pain. 
I kind of tried to do the whole season with my foot hurting, but it was a lot of like on and off. I got like a cortisone shot, which is a horrible thing for dancers and like ankles, especially because it makes your ankles weak and uh, it frays your ligaments. Um, so I was in a boot and off a boot and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And then I did dances at a gathering. I remember in a lot of pain, mm -hmm. like I was just trying to get through it. And then finally, like, oh, after a whole year of dealing with it, um, I came to New York. I saw some doctors, came back to Miami, and they're like, okay, we, you have a partial tear. Let's do, you know, a repair. And, yeah, I had surgery. I think it was my first year with Lourdes. I think it was 2012, like, yeah. in the spring. And um, it kind of worked out because I, I think I missed, like, one program in just, like, the summer rehearsals. Remember, we had that weird rehearsal period mm -hmm. in June. Um, but I was back on stage by, um, like program one, like in the fall that we're doing like polyphonia. So it was yes. like, that was like my first ballet back, like wheel, wheel those, uh, polyphonia. Um, I never had pain again on that ankle. Like he healed me and I could not believe it because it hurt just to, like bend my knees. So like do any plies for a whole year. And then suddenly I was like, oh my God, I don't have any pain, but it left me with a lot of scar tissue mm -hmm. and it made my left ankle so stiff, like. It still is so stiff. Like I have this difference of like dorsiflexion from one foot to the other. Uh, but it taught me a lot. Like that one definitely did. It wasn't like the first sprain that I was just like oblivious. Um, but it was hard. It was hard. I had a, I mean, I was in a very like bad place. I did not know how to deal with it. Definitely not. Right. That's, it's an interesting thing you brought up. Like the, the asymmetry of our bodies. Oh and how God, we're like yeah. always battling that. Like how, how do you deal with that? Like the lack of, ability to plie compared to the other foot no uh, sometimes i just try to shut it off and like ignore it but um well because correct me if i'm wrong but from my understanding you know like balancing style and technique uh there's this thing you know with vaganova training your heels are always on the floor like when you plie you know you when you land from things and for um balancing style technique it's like not that you lift them up, but if you get to the bottom of your plie, it's okay, your heels come up. So I think that that made it a little easier. So I just try to balance it out by lifting the right one as much as the left one lifts. Mm -hmm. But I still struggle. Like, it really gets in the way of my technique, like things that I take off from two feet, because it's just so different. It's something, like, um, that I can't really fix. And part of me, I'm like, I'm very proud, you know, I made this far because it's a significant difference. And... Um, but yeah, I just try to focus on other things and like, nah, I keep it strong, keep it loose, you know, do other, um, types of exercise that keep my body going and strong, but I'm, I, I'm grateful for it. It's, it's my better ankle. It never hurt again. And, um, yeah, I, I'm always like, thank you ankle for carrying me for all <laughs> these years. And like, even I put you through so much and you're still, you know, going strong. Like it's the leg that I use for everything. So, right. yeah. So your, your path from there continued very steadily. You know, yeah. you had a rep that anyone would kill for. Yeah. And at one point you even skipped a rank in promotions, yeah. went right to principal dancer. Um, what made you start to consider other options? You could have just stayed at Miami City Valley and been happy yeah. forever. Yeah. What made you want to take a risk and change companies? I mean, the New York City Valley honestly was a seed that was kind of like planted in my head as soon as I moved to the States because, like I said, I knew nothing about um, Miami City Valley School. All, all, all I knew was like ABT. Like in my head, it was like, you know, American Ballet Theater. We used to watch all these videos from like Paloma Herrera and Hel Corella like mm -hmm. at the time. Um, so when I moved to uh, Miami, you know, I learned about Balanchine and like, of course, by learning about Balanchine, you learn about New York City Ballet and therefore SAB. And I fell in love with the style, but then I learned, you know, there's a school, you have to go through the school to get into the company. So I completely put that aside. Very happy at Miami City Ballet. Like, had an amazing career. I always questioned it. I'm like, you know, there's like so many amazing dancers here. Like why, like what, what makes me, you know, get these opportunities and other people not. But anyway, that's like <laughs> my own, my own <laughs> imposter syndrome. And, um, but yeah, so I did have that thought in my head. And when I was seeing all the changes, when I saw what was happening in uh, New York City Ballet, you know, Peter Martins leaving as their artistic director and, you know, three principal dancers that had similar rep to what I had at Miami City Ballet. And um, 
I felt like I wanted a change. You know, I had a lot of things at Miami City Ballet. I had danced a lot. But because of my love for Balanchine, I was like, you know, if I want to dance more of this, this is the place that I need to be. And I knew it was a, you know, a far, you know, shot to aim for New York City Ballet. But I was like, you know, I'm just going to try, you know. What, what's the worst that could happen? They'll say no. And at the time, we had worked with Justin Pack um, a couple times at Miami City Ballet. And uh, he became part of the interim um, team, like for for them to find a new artistic director. And I just sent an email. This was on a Friday. We're coming back from Fort Lauderdale, from Broward, where we performed at Miami City Ballet. And I sent an email. I was like, hey, listen, I know this is a little unorthodox, but if you're ever willing to hire anybody from the outside, I would love to try out for New York City Ballet. And uh, Justin, I was like, please forward this email to Jonathan Steffer, Rebecca Cron, and Craig Hall, who were the they were the team at the time. And on Sunday, they got back to me. They're like, oh, we're actually interested if you're serious about this. And then the following week, I was going to Philadelphia to visit a friend. And I just stopped in New York for a day and Justin saw that I was there. He's like, well, since you're here, why don't you just come in and take class tomorrow? I had no ballet shoes. I had no tights, no nothing. I borrowed like Lee's um, leggings from American Apparel and like Andre <laughs> shoes. Like it was really not... I was not prepared for it, but it was actually great because then I didn't get on a plane like, oh my God, I'm auditioning for New York City Ballet. Like I had never auditioned in my life. Um, Yeah. I mean, that wasn't your question. Your question was, (laughs) why did I want to go? But but I really... This is interesting too. I mean, people... I I remember when you came into class. Yeah, it was like... (laughs) I'm assuming you've never auditioned either. No. I mean, we like being at SAB and getting right into New York City Ballet, we're lucky that we don't have to do those huge cattle call auditions. Right. Yeah. It's such a like scary process. Yeah. They're literally the worst. I mean, I was... I, I was crying in the morning before going to class. <laughs> I like I woke up and I was like really nervous. And I remember going to grab breakfast. Um, at, I don't remember where I went, but I was like crying, eating. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, I'm going to do this. And I got there and I just tried to like, do my best. It was very chill because it was like a warm-up class for New York City yeah, Ballet. Like, no one we knew. We were probably in season, right? Yeah, you so, guys like, were. It's like yeah. a- yeah. Different, different vibe. Yeah. And it was like a weird time because there was like the polar vortex. It was like the coldest day of the year. Oh, yeah. I this was like in yeah. 2019. It was like insane. And, but nobody knew I was auditioning. As far as everyone was concerned, I was just like a guest of like Just Impact taking class. And yeah, Rebecca was teaching. Craig maybe came to watch and John came to watch like the last two jumps. And Justin was there like watching the entire class. Um, yeah, so I sent the email on Friday. Sunday they said, yes, we're interested. Thursday I took the class, and then on Sunday they offered me the job. So like in 10 days, I like turned my life upside down. And it's not like I was planning this. It was on that Friday that I decided to send the email, and I sent it right away. Like very impulsive, like very impulsive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I was like, you know, I'm going to try. And yeah, and you, here we are. <laughs> so, so what was the adjustment like then? I mean, a lot of the rep is similar. There's a lot yeah. of overlap, but well, like I'm sure that the schedule is different. I'm oh sure my that God. The culture and the way how quickly everything moves. Is yeah. Different. There's a whole new company of very scary yeah. people like Mira. Yeah. It's so very, scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I had to do a lot of mental preparation. I think like I built a lot of walls because I thought people weren't going to be nice. First of all, I was like, Oh my God, it's New York like City Mira. Valley. Everyone's going to be cutthroat. <laughs> They're going to look down at me. And like, so I, came in and i tried like not being disrespectful like pretentious but i was like you know what you deserve to be here as Mm -hmm. much as they do i wasn't like hiding and like i remember my first class i had to like defend myself almost because i I took a spot at the bar like on the very corner and then like ashley bowder like walks in and she's like just so you know this has been my bar spot for 20 years (laughs) (laughs) and then i was like well i make sure i don't squeeze you then (laughs) And I feel like that kind of like sat the ground. And then like, even like in class in center, I was like, you know, trying to like be there not like try. I I was like, I'm not going to be invisible. Um, Mm -hmm. Didn't you end up doing Swan Lake with Bowder? Yeah, I did. I did. So yeah. like, I, my first show was actually with her. Right. Was that DGV? DGV. But I got in. It's just like New York City Ballet is like this crazy machine. And I don't think people realize, even from other companies, because there's so much rap and like we own all of our rap. We own our theater. Like. Our season is um, like our contract's like 37 weeks long 
And in those 37 weeks, we do between 60 to 70 ballets. So it's like a lot of material. And on those same weeks at Miami City Ballet, we did what, 12, yeah. 14? So it's, it's like crazy multiplied to be that your by contracts no longer. Like yeah, it's, right? It's Everyone really, thinks that. Like, it's about it the same as every company. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty average. You just pack it in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, because we don't rehearse that much. Yeah, that's the thing. We're performing a lot. Yeah, so out of those 37 weeks, 22 weeks out of are of performances. So when I got there, it was just like, I would be learning like six ballets in one day. I got thrown in into everything. Once again, like I found, I found myself in a position that I was like in the right place at the right time where I was like needed and I needed to be ready. Mm -hmm. You know, like all these, those years of like always making sure I knew what I was doing, but there, there wasn't a lot of time to right. learn. And, um, yeah, but I, I loved it. I just felt like so tired at the end of the day, but like so fulfilled. Um, but then when performances started approaching, I was learning DGV. I think I was learning the first movement, but I was like an understudy, maybe like third or fourth cast. Mm -hmm. And so in that first week that we we're going to open fall season, that was the only ballet that I was covering that was going to go in the, the program. Then casting came out and I didn't even really pay attention to it because I was like, oh, I'm not dancing. Like I'm only understudying this role. And then I'm just skimming through the casting and then I see my name and it's like, for Giovanni Forlan, DGV, second movement. And I was like, I don't even learn this. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's in two weeks because casting comes out two weeks before. I was like, I don't even learn this ballet. And then, um, yeah, I was like, I'm going to do it. But I, they haven't called a rehearsal and it's on like 10 business days. <laughs> um, and then it still took three more days for me to have a rehearsal and start learning the role. And it's like, because now I've done, I mean, I've only done two movements, but I know that that's like, the hardest one. I mean, fourth is hard because you go all in straight into the finale. Mira's glaring. Yeah, Mira's like, mm, <laughs> how dare Ch you? Chad's in the audience. You <laughs> can't <laughs> um, Anyway, so I I hadn't even learned the role and I was already cast, cast for it. And then it took three more days for me to call, be called to a rehearsal. And then the other dancer that was the first cast got injured because I was second cast. So I was going to do it on Saturday, I think, of that week. But then since the first cast got injured, I got pushed back to first cast which was on wednesday so that gave me even last time like i had like five like four or five rehearsals and it it was so exhausting i had like i was really worried about the stamina so i would go home fill a suitcase with whatever i could find to make it really heavy just play the music and do the whole battle like holding a suitcase in my living room i was like that wow, crazy that's very impressive I, it was that crazy um <laughs> So that was my first experience. So that kind of like set the tone. And, but throughout, like, I mean, I only had eight months before, you know, COVID started. Mm -hmm. So it, everything, you know, it was too much information. I, I guess I wasn't like processing like the, how the work happens in New York City Ballet. Just now I feel like I'm getting my groove. Um, yeah, but the entire season was kind of like that. Like I got thrown into Swan Lake, but like the full length, like, two weeks before mm -hmm. like with Ashley Bowder and like she put in a good word because she was like no he did DGV with me in like three rehearsals it would be fine so uh -huh. yeah but like that first season I remember like my last week of winter season I did like a like I did a not a performances but like a ballads in the week because I was like doing G major like episodes and like it was just insane so just I did it I in like eight months in New York City Ballet I did something that would have taken me like six years to do at Miami City Ballet so like yeah it, i mean the rehearsal adjustment must have been pretty intense i mean oh yeah we rehearse things forever yeah like ever. six weeks at least and, and yeah. they all would have always like i mean justin had this joke justin peck when he'd be he'd be like how's it going down there you guys rehearsed in symphony in three because we were never not rehearsing symphony oh my god yeah, so we Every did symphony three. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was the staple but now you're going into things where like i'm sure like people get thrown into symphony in three and they have to learn it in like an hour oh yeah yeah, yeah. like Sometimes we go on stage to do like a complete rehearsal, which is when like everyone comes together and, and we're in costumes, hopefully, <laughs> if they're ready, um, without even knowing the choreography. Like people are learning on right. stage. Like there are things, but even for like a major role, like Tchaikovsky Pada did, like me and Unity were like talking about it. We did not have like, I was like, I don't think we had 10 rehearsals. She was like, we had seven rehearsals. Like, which is insane to like prepare a major role like that. I mean, mm -hmm. sure, but like it's so technical and so it's it's wild. Yeah. It definitely, I feel is like wild. I'm so like desensitized to that that I'm like seven. That's fine. Yeah, no, <laughs> but now it's just 
it's just a different way of looking like we're talking with um or ABT peers that are here. And they're like, but how do you, how do you get into the role? How do you get into the character? How do you learn the layers? I'm like, you don't. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> you, you do it you throughout it the stage. year. Yeah, you learn on stage, but you do it throughout the years. You know, like, oh, I've been doing this role for 10 years. Yeah, and then you, come back. yeah, then you mm-hmm. build up those layers. But when you first go on stage, it's like very spontaneous. Like, and I really do love that. Right. Yeah. So f- actually for both of you, can you tell me what like your, the, the I guess worst it's not not necessarily inherently a bad thing but what's the the least amount of time you've had preparing a role and just <clears throat> had to do it hmm. well I when I did rubies for the first time it was like Giovanni was saying with DGV like casting came out and I was cast and I hadn't rehearsed it yet oh. um so that was that was a quick <laughs> turnaround I've got I mean I've gotten thrown into like many core things the uh-huh. day of um but yeah. you just do it and it yeah keeps it just fresh. do it for me it was um uh the divertissement pas de deux in the second act of midsummer i had a rehearsal and a half <laughs> with sterling and then i had to do the show and it's just like i don't know a minute pas de deux that's very intricate very you know like almost like religious you know in a way because it's so it's just this moment during the ballet that people kind of just like sit and they're like admiring it so that was like the least amount of rehearsal that i had but it's like sterling so she kind of like yeah just do it <laughs> she's yeah. beautiful yeah so um you know covid happened but we're just gonna gloss right over that because i know we want to get to some questions from the audience and talk about something a little bit more celebratory your promotion to principal yes. that happened this year yeah. um you know you had to take um a step down to join yes. your city ballet as a soloist and you're doing all this great rep but was that in the back of your mind? Like, that's something that I would like to achieve to to come back to that level. Oh, yeah, definitely. But, like, I'll tell you that when I auditioned, if they had offered me a core contract, I would have gone. I was, mm-hmm. like, up for it. But I was very happy to come in as a soloist. And, like, um, I saw because of the way my trajectory was going there, like, even for my first Nutcracker, I was like, oh, definitely, like, do Spanish here. Because even at Miami City Ballet, I used to do it. And a lot of soloists do it. But I was, like, only doing Cavalier, and then I did, like, Swan Lake. So I was, like, I saw, you know, <clears throat> not in a pretentious way. like, But I was, like, okay, they want to push me. They definitely want this, you know, to come my way. Um, so, yeah, I definitely, like, wanted that. And, like, also, like, being Brazilian, I was, like, you know, it would be the first time that they have, like, a Brazilian principal in the company. Um, so, yeah, and I knew, I, of course, you get so anxious and you want it to happen. You're, like, oh, is it going to happen? Like, um so I definitely wanted it, and I knew it was coming, but I just, I, I wanted it. <laughs> I really <laughs> did, yeah. 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 So this was your first year in Vail. Yes. Um, you know, we can ask all the, the usual questions. How is the altitude? Mm. Like, what's the, you know, just just give us a little overview of um, what you got to perform this year and what, what you, um, what, what your experience was like. Um, I mean, I guess from, like, look uh, watching the festival from afar for years like it's a place i always wanted to come and when damien invited me i was like so excited and like uh honored because i always admired the artists that are in the festival but i did not know what was coming my way uh it's very intense um we learn i l- learned well i learned two of them in new york not fully but like working on three different ballets in like five days and just like put them on stage like for the Merce cunningham piece it was mm-hmm. my first time uh, being uh, getting to dance um, Cunningham's work and very intricate a lot of detail and we had this pas de trois. there were 30 phrases of the count was one two one two three one two three four one two three four five and 30 phrases of that and we had three days to learn it and like just put it on stage um, so that was wild but you know it speaks to the experience of being at New York City Ballet which is helpful mm-hmm. um, but it's been great. It's so uh, inspiring to see all these artists come together and everyone's like very happy to be here. And it's like an adult, you know, summer program almost, you know, right. that we all come together from different places and we're learning all these works and we put a show at the end of it. So that's kind of what it feels like. Super organized also, like we're very well taken, like they take really good care of us, which right. is great. Yeah. So uh, a few guests, I think in the past week or so, will have mentioned like, things that they would like to do in Vail. So why don't we just hear dream ballets for each of you? Like what, okay. Damien and Heather, what are, what are you going to give us next year? Damien, <laughs> if you're listening to this. <laughs> um, I definitely want to do more ballet, you know, like Balanchine, um, Balanchine's works. And I'd love to do dual concert time here. 
Uh, maybe some stars and stripes, which is like one of my dream roles. I know it's going to be really hard here with all. We've teachers. got a partner right here. Yeah, she, it's hard been to through see, it. Yeah, it, I don't know if I'm going to volunteer for that. Yeah. But. <laughs> um, and because now, like being in New York City ballet, I don't get the opportunity to dance classical ballet like I did in Miami City ballet. Uh, I would love to like get a Giselle in there, because um, like I think it's like my favorite mm-hmm. classical ballet. Um, but I'm open for everything, like Agon maybe, or things you know I wouldn't do in New York City Ballet. I don't know. Mary this knows Agon. Ballet. I'm really just I'm really pushing really? for this partnership. <laughs> yeah, Ballet Diamonds Pa here. That would be amazing. So, Mira. Yeah. Um, I mean, those all sound great. Diamonds <laughs> would be fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess maybe something classical since we don't usually do that. Um, I saw ABT do um, Romeo and Juliet recently, and I was like, I'm never going to do Juliet, but like doing the balcony paw on a gig would be so fun. So yeah. I don't know. Maybe that one day. Yeah. Damien, if you're listening, okay. hook us up. Let's <laughs> <laughs> make it happen. Uh, all right. I think we have a little bit of time to get some audience questions in. Okay. Um, the first question I, I, I ask all artists that not so anything you do um, outside the dance that you think helps you to become a fuller person and also makes you a better artist, a better dancer. This is the first one. Second one, I thought, since you mentioned injury and how difficult it is, um, and I personally, I definitely felt that. I started taking ballet classes to help me to understand how difficult you guys go. Mm -hmm. So for you personally, all the difficult times, not on stage, especially when you are dealing with the injuries, rehearsing. What do you, what do you, what, what's the message you tell yourself or something you do um, that help you get over the fatigue mm-hmm. and all the crazy thoughts you have <laughs> and help you perform better on stage? Mm, I'll tell you when I find out. <laughs> uh, no, great questions. Uh, I think the first one, I will respond both because I also think they complement each other. Um, I think first, the things that help me like grow as an artist is definitely um, disassociate sometimes from ballet and just like really go into other things, other interests. I think um, whenever I feel like there's something I don't understand about myself or I can't explain or that I just want to learn, it's like books, like reading definitely like feeds uh, parts of me that I can't find anywhere else. Music too, a lot of, you know, um, artists that like me and Michael have similar musical tastes. Um, <laughs> We have the musical taste of a 17-year-old yeah, girl. Yeah, 17-year-old but. girl. <laughs> but, you know, uh, so those things and uh, being exposed to other types of uh, art and artists. And, um, yeah, and that helps me with the other things, too, with the injuries. And um, I practice, like, mindfulness a lot in my life. You know, I meditate every morning and I do breath work and I take cold showers. And, like, I think all these little things, you know, um, they add up and also throughout the year sometimes I start meditating I'm like oh I don't feel anything like why is this not changing me but it takes years you know of like doing something and um and you know just letting it like come to you and like absorb it and also that you know I mean I take I'm very committed like to my career I'm very like addicted to ballet like but also at the same time I'm like it's just ballet like I'm just gonna go out there and like try my hardest like you know it's not it's not the end of the world like you know sometimes i'm like oh the ice is melting there's a war like what does it matter if i point at my feet or not but i still come in and do it you know but it's important to um realize in the big big scheme of things that like you know i just come in and i do my best and i try to uh be devoted to whoever's in front of me in the room and um take it in and know that like I have to take this opportunity now because this is the only time I can do ballet, you know, like my body, you know, at one point is not going to want to do it anymore. So I'm just going to do it now. And um, and like I like the Alexei Ratmansky quote, I think a lot of people knew about it, like during the pandemic that he said that, you know, COVID is like rehearsal for retirement. And I felt like I could do that, get a little like taste of that and like see the other interests that I have. So I think it's good to... Um, 
be able to disassociate and associate to other things, you know. So. The cold shower, that's very intense. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Here I got in the creek. It was literally yesterday, like an hour and a half <laughs> before the show. Full body. I was just in the creek. I, it does wonders. I mean, cold, I think cold water is your friend. So, uh, Isabella Boylston says she takes a, a steaming hot shower before she does full length Swan Lake. Oh, That's well, her like trick warm up. Well, I did do that after, but it's, it's, um, I don't know. The cold water for me, it's like relaxing and it puts you in that like fight or flight mode. Um, that makes like the other challenges like easier, you know? Like when I come in, I'm like, I can take a cold shower. I can just Swan Lake, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah. Right here. I think you were in Justin's ballet piece last night. Yes. And so I had a question. All week we've heard choreographers talk about uh, choreographing for particular bodies. So mm -hmm. when Justin did that part, was he? Did he do it mindful of your ankle problem? And oh. I also was curious. I imagine that you all love the parts where you could pretend to be sleeping on the floor <laughs> and and regain your breath and hoping. Chris sang on a little while. Yeah. In the well, actually, I, last night was not. I was not in Justin's ballet. Oh. I was in the first like two days. I did do a, one of his pieces here, but I I did have the same thought watching the dancers. I'm like, I'm sure they're very happy because they're going just like so hard, so hard, and go on the floor. Uh, but I, I can answer, you know, differently about my ankle. I don't like really disclose it. I don't even think like John and Wendy or like any maybe Justin knows because we have like a personal relationship. Um, but I usually try to not talk about it. I don't want to be like, oh, poor me, you have to change it. Maybe I should, but um, I try to just like work around it and just like, people don't notice. Sometimes when I bring up, like I brought it up to like Katie Tracy, one of our repertory directors, she was like, but you have a huge plie, I never noticed. And then I showed it to her, she was like, oh my God, how do you dance? <laughs> don't let uh, her know. <laughs> I know I should like hide it. But then at the same time, I'm like, if, if I fall off, it's it my ankle. <laughs> it's not me. It's not me. It's him. <laughs> so good. You know? Yeah. Duke. Tom. Um, you rocked that Cunningham. Um, what was your training, like your preparation to do Cunningham? Mm. And then second question is, I noticed you're designing costumes now. So can you talk about that? Okay. Um, so for Cunningham, like we had three days, so it wasn't a lot. But Melissa, Melissa Too Good, who works with us, she's very hands-on. So like from day one, she would like you know, touch my back and, like, make sure I was, like, contracting yeah. from the and right she, she place. She worked with Merce. Yeah, herself, so, yeah. like, she really knows what's up. And she's very, like, direct. And, like, she always, like, this is what I have to do. This is the count. This is that. Um, I will tell you, like, I think it came kind of naturally. Like, I, it spoke to me the way the work um, is, is made. That piece, I don't know if other pieces, I would feel the same way. So I was um, very excited to work on this like more like dry uh, way of moving because for so many things we kind of put on this uh, characters and facade sometimes and for immerse like you're rehearsing silence you don't listen you don't hear the music until you're on stage like you're not even supposed to really be paying attention to it um so i i think i was just excited to be working on something new and um I did not have that much preparation, so I don't know if I was able to like embody it. You know, it takes years to do something like that. And I posted a little clip on my Instagram, like of rehearsal, and then I got like corrections from people. people <laughs> like, Your arm should be stiffer. And, like, Sorry, I just learned this yesterday. <laughs> uh, so but good. Melissa was great, and like I'm sure that now, like having done that, she was like, "You're gonna keep doing this." So I was like, "Okay," got into the Mars universe, and um. During the pandemic, I do remember uh, taking a class because they were having like live classes and Sarah Mearns does a lot of Cunningham. Um, yeah, so that was very cool to get to do that here. And as far as the costume design, yeah, which I'm very excited about. It's actually that I have, I started my own dancewear line. This is like my pandemic baby when I was in Brazil, you know, the, the thing going back to rehearsal for our retirement, I was like, what else, you know, is out there that I could do? And my father was like super supportive for years. He's been telling me, oh, you should start a dancewear line. I was like, oh, dad, it's so much work. Like, I just want to do pirouettes. Like, I don't want to <laughs> respond to emails and talk to like factories and like a fabric. Um, so I worked on that while I was in Brazil to start my own dancewear line. I saw like in the market that there's this huge gap that there's no... Uh, Mayo dedicated brands, you know, there's a lot of dancewear lines that they have like sub lines for Mayo dancers. So I figured that that's something I, I could do um, and, you know, fill this gap in the market. And I also like, 
I mean, it's a little cliche, but I always feel like so grateful really in my life. And like, especially when I started like going to meditation and like mindfulness, spirituality. And I was like, you know, it's, life is good. I have all these things. Like, how do I thank the world or like the people that helped me? And like with the brand was something that I like, could use that to like combine those two things. And, um, you know, I was like, you know, I can do this and I like, give back to dancers. So I started the brand with the idea. I was like, you know, it's, it's not just going to be like for, you know, filling the gap in the market or for the sake of like making money, you know, um, I want to be able to give back. So like I set aside also from the, the brand 10% of the profits to Brazilian dancers, uh, there, you know, in this transition period of like, Oh, I have to go audition and I need to buy like a plane ticket. Cause I depended on all of this. Like I always depended on support. Um, I had a scholarship for seven years in Brazil and then Miami city ballet scholarship. And I had to have like people like the family come together and like help with money for me to buy, buy my flights, like even get a passport, like all these things were so out of reach. So that was the idea to start the brand. And then Justin didn't have a costume for his ballet. And then like he said, saw that I had the dancewear line. He was like, Oh, I want to use a dancewear for the costumes, which was super cool. Like, I mean, the brand has been out for like two months and like I've already had all these like opportunities. So it's very cool. I'm very happy about it. I think we have time for one more question. <clears throat> <laughs> I, I always learn stuff at these conversations. I had no idea how different New York City Ballet was in terms of preparation from all these other places. That is really mind blowing. Yeah. I realize what you guys actually do. So, you know, congratulations. In some ways, condolences. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Question I wanted to ask. So, we saw you yesterday afternoon getting ready with the, uh, Kylie Kwan's uh, thing over in the tent, which is ridiculously hot. Yeah. <laughs> and the mask. And, and, the, the question I wanted to ask you was this sort of, you know, for all the other dances you do, there's a sort of choreography exists, and you go learn that choreography even in two days or, you know, mm -hmm. weeks or whatever. But for Kylie's stuff, and I presume that's true for all of these commissioned works, you have to learn that stuff as it's being created. And I just wondered, how did, how did that, does, does that process itself feel different to you, or was it just kind of, you, you, that's the way we do things? Oh, it definitely feels different to have like someone, something choreographed on you, like having someone in front of the room. And there's um, <clears throat> also room for you to putting like your almost like brand on it. And like Kylie's great about it. <clears throat> so uh, even when I'm learning something that it's already been choreographed, I try to like be me in it. But um, having someone uh, do steps on you is a very different process. It's some somewhat sometimes harder for you to know, like, get the musicality, like, and try to fit someone's um, image of what the piece is supposed to be, like, when you have, you know, the choreographer in front of you. Uh, but it's a great process, but it's definitely, like, very, very different from having, you know, like, all oh, the steps already exist, and I'm going to try to uh, fit in. And then that gives you space um, to, yeah, put your your yourself in it and it's really cool it's a really cool thing to have something choreographed on you but it's hard when it's like this fast you know it's a, this was you know three days we did work in new york for maybe five days me and kylie but then we got here she changed like <laughs> the whole thing she was like oh i'm gonna use that one step from those five days uh -huh. that we worked <laughs> so um yeah but i think um came out like very very nicely and <clears throat> yeah kylie's choreography it's really hard, really demanding because it's very full out. But because of how she used the like Caroline Shaw's score and the movement, it like made us hung hungry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Even when you're so exhausted, like you just want to like go for it and like go harder, which is which is like how you want to feel sometimes. It's hard doing something like oh my god, I'm dreading that step. Like I was like, no, I'm excited to do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you both for joining us. Yes, it's a wrap thank on you. Festival Forums this guys. year. Come back yes. and see Giovanni and Mira do Diamonds and Romeo and Juliet yes, next year. Yes, Balcony Pa. We're going to start rehearsing. So I have <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>